Let's uh, ask the Lord uh, to speak to us this morning as we hear his word. Let's pray. Father, as we just sung, we want you in our lives. And as we spend the next uh, several moments here this morning, we pray that as we hear your word, that you would speak, that you would encourage us, sharpen us, help us to know that these things are true and help us to live your truth out in our world this week. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, all of you know the power of social media. And I was impressed uh, this week. Sarah put out online on Friday, uh, bef the day before our event, that we were having this free yard sale. And what's amazing is that many people liked it, they shared it, and over 2,000 people saw that website in just a matter of a couple of hours. I think that's pretty amazing that you can get that word out so quickly. Now, many of us like to use social media because it's a great way of showing and declaring the things in our lives. We spend hours and hours trying to craft just that right word, that right phrase to send out into the internet. Or we take that picture and we crop it and we adjust the, the color because we want it to just be beautiful. And if we're honest, many of us do that because we like it when other people like our stuff. Uh, it's even better if people share our stuff with others. And the best of all is when people actually look at your stuff that you post and comment on it and, and say wonderful things about it. Well, for me, I'm used to using Facebook as a social media platform. The problem is, if you didn't know this, Facebook now is not cool. Did you know that? All our teenagers are like, yep, we knew this for a long time. If you're a teenager, most teenagers, are teenagers do not use Facebook. Um, it's, and it's a relevant social media platform. So here's the deal. As, as a youth pastor, as, as serving teenagers, if, if I want to see the content that the teens are putting out, I'm not going to find it on Facebook. If I want to see the things that they have posted, the things that they're interested in, I need to get connected with what they are doing to the, the platforms and the sites where they are at. Uh, this morning, I think all of us know this, that God wants you to connect with him. Uh, God loves you and wants a relationship with you. He, he wants to have you know his presence. He wants you to see the things that he does and to like the things that he does. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 19 that God is continually pouring out his knowledge. Psalm 19 verse 1 and 2 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So every day, God is broadcasting the things that he's doing. Every day, he's posting his handiwork to us. The problem is, for many people, they're not connecting with that God. Uh, for many of us, sometimes it's just like we're going through life and we're just scrolling past the things that he is doing and the things that he has for us in our life. Uh, God wants us to know him, but for many people, what God is doing is hidden because we're not connected in the right way with him. Here's some examples of God being hidden from others. Hosea 5, 6 says this, they shall seek the Lord, but they will not find him because he has withdrawn from them. The passage we looked at last week in 1 Corinthians talks about this. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 says, Paul imparts a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before our ages and for our glory. So Paul here is saying, there is this knowledge of God, there is this wisdom of God that you haven't accessed, uh, that you haven't known before, and I, Paul, am here because I want you to get connected with that God. 1 Corinthians 2.9 continues this thought by saying, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So here's this tension that Paul introduces in this passage. Yes, God wants us to know him. God wants you to love him. But there are things about God that are hidden, and you have to go to the right place to find that knowledge and that wisdom. 
So why is God hidden from us? Have you ever had those experiences where you wanted to know God's presence, his peace, and he seems far away? Why is it that God is not easily accessible? Why is it that there's a group of people called the agnostics who who say that, yes, there may be a God, but you can't really know him. Uh, There's a group of people who said, if God would just show himself, then I would believe. So why is God hidden? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is because God is not like us. (laughs) We are human, we are made of flesh and bone, and God is invisible. God is spirit, and we cannot see a spiritual being with our physical eyes. Another reason why we don't see God is because we are sinful. (laughs) We are broken and frail people, and God is a holy and perfect and just God. There are many examples of scripture in the Bible where a sinful person wanted to encounter God. Remember Moses, he said, God, I want to see your presence. And God told Moses, you can't see me. If you see me, you're going to die. If you remember, uh, the prophet Isaiah and John both had visions of God, and as a result, they fell down as dead. Why? Because we as humans are sinful and frail, and God is holy. So there is this truth, there's this tension, because God is hidden, and yet he so desperately wants us to know him. He so desperately wants us to have a relationship with him. So this morning, the question we're going to look at is this. How do we know God? How do we come to know him better? Let me put it this way. What links would you go to in order to find God? Uh, Let's say that it was revealed that God is on a mountaintop over on the other side of the world. Would you buy that plane ticket? Uh, Would you make that journey to trek up the mountain just to spend a few hours in the presence of God, if that was possible? Uh, what links would you go? Where, how far would you travel to meet God? Well, I want to share good news with you this morning. You don't have to travel to a distant place uh, to get to know God. You don't have to go to Israel. You don't have to go to a special spiritual place. You can know God intimately and personally. And the whole message this morning is sharing with you this wonderful truth that the God who is hidden can be known. That this God loves you and he wants a relationship with you and you can know him personally and intimately. So Paul shares with us how God can be known in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you would turn there this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 9. Paul wanted the Corinthians to truly know God. And as we talked about in the last couple of weeks, uh, the Corinthians were confused about how to know God. They had different religious leaders who gave, gave great teaching, and the Corinthians thought that in order to know God, you had to have, be like this person, or you had to follow this individual. They thought that the knowledge of God came by following a person or a personality. And so Paul writes to correct that misunderstanding, and in doing so, he helps us to know how we can have an intimate relationship with God. So the good news is you can know God this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 say this. It is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man Im- imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, Paul here is saying, there are things about God that you don't know right now. And then verse 10, check out this good news. He says, But these things, these unknown mysterious things about God, God has revealed to you. And how has God revealed that hidden wisdom? Through his spirit. So how do we know God, this hidden, mysterious God? The only way we know him is through his spirit. And this morning, you can know God because of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the key which unlocks the mysteries and the knowledge of God. If you imagine for a moment that God is locked or hidden behind a door, and there are many people who want to access God, want to be in his presence. They want to know him, but God does not just open the door for any reason. The only thing that can open the door of his knowledge is the key that is the Holy Spirit. So this passage introduces us to this wonderful knowledge of the Trinity. 
This truth that there is a God, one God, but he is known in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we know that God the Father is not God the Son, and God the Father is not God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit is not God the Son or the God the Father, and the God the Son is not God the Father or God the Spirit. They are all unique individual persons, but one true Godhead. Someone help me out. Can anybody explain that? Uh, to me, that is a mystery. It's a truth about God that is revealed to us, but is something that is hard to understand. Many people have tried to explain it with illustrations like an egg. You have three parts of an egg, but that is one God. So how do we know God? This verse tells us that God is known by God. Okay, is that helpful? Does that help us out? It kind of seems like this is a non-answer, doesn't it? How do we know the mysteries and wonder of God? Well, God. Uh, a, a theologian said these words. Uh, he wrote, God is known through God in God alone. Let me say that again. God is known through God and through God alone. This is why Paul writes this, and this is, I think, why it's so helpful for us to know that God can only be known by God. You see, we can't go to God on our own terms. Uh, God won't go to us by our own guesses, our own imagination. We won't know God through our works or our efforts or our endeavors. The only way for God, for us to know God, is if God comes to us. And the great truth of this passage that Paul is saying is, I've got good news. God came to me, and God revealed himself to me. Uh, when, when Sarah and I first bought our house here in Vassar, uh, I think I've shared the story before, uh, it was the fall season, it was about September, October, and we had a cold spell. And Sarah and I found it at that moment that our house did not have any gas connected to it. Our furnace was not working. And usually, as a, as a child, I had no concerns about the heat. I just thought, you pushed a button, and the heat came on. It was like magic. Um, I found out as an adult, things aren't magic like that. <laughs> so as an adult, I figured I got to take care of my family. I got to do something here to provide heat for the house. So I needed to go to the source. So I called up Consumers Energy and said, we need help. And guess what they did? They said, we have to investigate you for a little bit. And so they investigated us for a while to make sure we weren't, there wasn't any fraud. But then they came, they connected the gas, and our furnace worked. If you want to know God, the only way to know him is to be connected to the source. Uh, you're not going to get any power. You're not going to know him unless you're connected to the source, which is the spirit. God is known through God and through God alone. So, with that non-answer, which is an answer, how does the Holy Spirit help us to know God? And that's what Paul here shares with us in these next verses. And this is important for us to look through. How, is, how do we get God's word into our heart? How do we know him? This, it's by the Spirit, and this is what the Spirit does for us. Look at verse 10, the end of verse 10 through verse 11. Paul tells us this. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So how does the Spirit of God help us know God? Well, the Holy Spirit is kind of like a lawyer. The Holy Spirit is kind of like a lawyer. Have any of you ever seen that movie, A Few Good Men? Uh, it's a story with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson, and, and the story is the Jack Nicholson's character, he's a general, and the lawyers think that he is corrupt, that he is doing wrong things. And so Tom Cruise is sitting um, in the courtroom, and he is searching out the general, Jack Nicholson's character, and he's trying to probe him and help him to reveal the truth. And I love that line in the film where Tom Cruise says, I want to know the truth! And what does Jack Nicholson say? Oh, come on, say it like with passion. What does he say? You can't handle the truth, right. So, I think in part, Paul is saying this about God. There is a mystery to God. There is a truth about God. And in and of ourselves, we can't handle the truth. But the Holy Spirit can. 
And the Holy Spirit here says that he is like a lawyer. He is searching the depths and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And from God, he is pulling the deep resources of the Father and passing it along to us. And verse 11 gives a very interesting analogy. He, he says in these verses uh, that, for an example, no one knows what the thoughts of a human being are. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of a God. And that's really truth, right? That's self-evident. I, I don't know what any of you are thinking about right now. Maybe some of you are probing the depths of what the Trinity is. Maybe some of you are thinking about lunch. I, I don't know what you are thinking. I don't have that ability. In the same way, the Holy, we don't know the mind of God. We don't know what he is thinking and what he is doing. But there's someone who does, the Holy Spirit, who, like a lawyer, is mining the depths and the resources and the love of God. So listen, in our life, do we want to know the truth? Do we want to know the truth about who God is and what he is like and what he has done for us? If you're like me, how many of you are just sick of lies? Uh, How many of you are, are sick of the deception that is out there in the world? And there are so many false beliefs about who God is and what God does. There are so many false religions that are describe God in, in wrong ways. And that picture of that other people are presenting can just muddle our thinking and confuse our lives. But I'm so thankful that the Spirit knows the truth about God. The Spirit plums the depths of who God is. And so we can have confidence that we can know the truth by his spirit. So the Holy Spirit is like a lawyer. And then I want you to notice not only is the spirit plumb the depths of God for us, but the spirit takes that truth and he reveals it to us. Aren't you thankful for that morning that the Holy Spirit takes his truth of God and gives it to us? Look what Paul says in verse 12. Paul admits... Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. So the Holy Spirit helps us to know God, not only because he knows the mind of God, he's like a lawyer, but also because he is like an interpreter. Uh, The Holy Spirit is like an interpreter revealing God to us. The Holy Spirit says that he spoke to Paul about who God is. And I kind of think of it like someone who interprets the words of doing sign language for as interpretation. Uh, You guys ever watched the speeches that the governor gave this year? Many speeches, right? And I've always found it amusing as the governor was speaking that you'd have the person back there doing the, the hand motions. And sometimes I wonder, because I don't know sign language. Anybody here know sign language? Maybe a, maybe a little bit? Uh, I was always wondering, were they doing it right? Maybe, I mean, if, if it was me and I was a sign language for the governor, I would like, I'd have fun with that. I'd, I'd make some stuff up, you know, just, just to see if anybody was paying attention. See, what's interesting uh, about, I don't know a lot about sign language, but I think is interesting is um, when a person is doing sign language, they don't do the same word order that the person is speaking. The word order is different. Like we speak a noun, verb, they speak verb first, and noun and sign language is kind of like Yoda speak when you're doing sign, sign language. Uh, and, and also, sometimes there might not be the right word. There might not be a sign that correlates with the word. So the sign, signer has to do some figuring in order to make it make sense. Well, I think that is what the Holy Spirit does here with Paul. The, the Spirit plumbs the depths and the knowledge and the wisdom of God, and then Paul hears those words in his own vernacular, his own language, his own personality, and so he gets those words and communicates them in a way that humans can understand. Um, the Holy Spirit did the same thing with John. Remember the book of Revelation. Can you imagine being John and being in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit telling you about the future. Can you imagine living in the first century and having it revealed to you modern world or what the future is now or what it might be in the future? Can you imagine trying to describe automobiles or the internet or electricity? Those things would have been unimaginable. Words and things that John could not comprehend. So the Holy Spirit took John where he was at 
and interpreted the future so he could understand and make sense of it and so that we could understand it too. So I'm glad that when people interpreting, um, when people interpret, we don't want them to just make words up, right? If someone is signing, if they're going to do a good job, they need to do, be faithful to the words. And so I'm thankful. What Paul says here is he didn't make things up. Uh, When the Holy Spirit spoke to him, he didn't change the words. He didn't change the meaning. He delivered what the Holy Spirit gave to you. It says here, we didn't receive a spirit of this world. In other words, he wasn't just making things up or going along with the culture. He revealed what the Holy Spirit told him. And notice that it says here that Paul didn't hold anything back. He didn't reserve any words. It says what he freely received from God, he passed that along. So can you imagine being Paul? Can you imagine what that would be like to to have the Holy Spirit come to you and share with you the depths and the wisdom and the riches of God and his knowledge. Uh, Paul received a wonderful gift. And the amazing thing about Paul is Paul could have just said, thank you, Holy Spirit. I feel edified. I feel great now. Thank you for that. No, he says, I took what the Spirit gave me and I passed it on. I freely gave it. You see, The Holy Spirit was an interpreter revealing the depths of God and giving it to us as men and as human beings. And so what I love is that this is what this book is, isn't it? This is the book that all of us as Christians revere and celebrate because this book is not just a book of human writing. We believe that the words written here are words that people heard from the Holy Spirit and wrote down what they heard for us. So when we read these words, we are reading the very words of God. Peter writes about this in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says this, When we heard from the Spirit, we did not follow clearly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And 2 Peter 1.21 says this, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter says, this book isn't made up. What I'm writing to you is the true word of God. So this morning, let's pay attention to what God has for us. You know, as I read these words from 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter, let's remember that these aren't just mere words. They're not just mere inspirational sayings. These are the very breath and words of God. When you hear me speak Know that the words from God's word, from the words that I'm reading from Scripture, are from Him. And these are the words that change our hearts and our lives. And these are the words that help us to know God. So know this, that Paul says that the Spirit of God is our lawyer. Like a lawyer, he is like an interpreter. But more than that, the Spirit is our teacher. Look with me at verse 13. Paul writes these words, and... We impart these words to you, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths with those who are spiritual. Uh, The New King James Version says, comparing the spiritual with the spiritual. In this verse, Paul is telling us that not only does the Spirit uh, reveal himself to people like Paul, but the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us through those words. Uh, Does anybody here ever have a a teacher that they loved and they admired? Uh, Maybe someone in high school or or college? Um, Go ahead and tell the person to your favorite teacher. Who is your your most favorite teacher? Share that with your person next to you. Real quick. When when I was in college, um, I had a, a professor who taught philosophy. And my freshman year, I had a philosophy class with him, and I hated it. Uh, I did not understand anything what he was talking about. He said things like deontological, epistemology, uh, philo- well, philosophy, didn't know what that was, postmodernism, all these goggly goop big words. And I said, nuts to this. Well, because of my major, I had to take another class with him later on. And I I was like, oh no, here we go. And it was another philosophy class. 
And I remember sitting down and he described this. You know, he said, learning philosophy is kind of like climbing a mountain. I'll never forget him saying this. At first, everything is, you're walking through trees. Nothing makes sense. But the higher you go, the longer you go, the way becomes clear and you're able to see. And it's amazing that that class, he was a really good teacher because I'm not an expert on philosophy now, but I know a little bit. I know enough to be dangerous. Uh, I learned from his teaching, and he's one of the, the, the greatest teachers that, that I've experienced because he helped me to see something that I've never seen before. Well, the Spirit is our good teacher. The Spirit helps us to see things that we've never seen before. And if you notice in verse 13, the way that he does this is, one of the ways that he does this is by giving us a new vocabulary. Look again at verse 13. He says, we impart to you words, not with human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. In other, in other, way, in other words, the Holy Spirit gives us a spiritual vocabulary, a, a new way of understanding God. Uh, you know, it's important to learn new vocabulary if you're going to learn a new skill. If you want to become a doctor, you have to learn a new vocabulary, right? There, there are all these words and jargon you need to learn. If you're going to be a computer technician, there's lots of jargon that you need to learn, like R-A-M and L-A-N and other A-Ns. I don't know them all. Uh, if you want to text with your children and grandchildren, you have to learn a new texting language, right? Uh, how many of you know what LOL stands for? We all do, right? What is LOL? All right, what about IMHO? Anybody know? In my humble opinion. All right, what about R-O-F-T-L? No, I said that wrong. R-O-T-F-L? Rolling on the floor laughing. Yes, okay. Maria, what are some other jargon that we should know. I won't point you out, sorry. Yeah, she's like, don't look at me. If we want to learn to communicate in that way, we need a new language. Well, the same thing is true for us. In order for us to know God, he gives us a new spiritual language. Um, in other words, you probably heard this before. Have you ever heard of church words? There are things like sanctification, glorification, uh, what we've looked at this morning are words like in, in inspiration and revelation. Uh, these are big terms that we don't have to use, but the idea is God imparts these concepts and these truths to us that without the Holy Spirit, we would have no idea what they are. We'd have no idea of their reality. But through God's word, he imparts to us these great spiritual truths. And the wonderful thing is as we learn the vocabulary written in God's word, we come to know God. Uh, for example, on the screen, there's a, a picture of, of the night sky. I hope it shows up. Can you see the... Boy, does it look like anything? It looks better on the back. Look on the back screen. It looks a little bit better on the back screen. Everyone turn back. All right, it's better than the screen up there. All right, so there's a, a picture of the night sky. So when you look at the night sky sometime, you, you can ask someone, what do you see? And the answer is, I see stars. Well, what else do you see? Oh, that's it. I just see stars. And about 10 years ago, when I looked at the night sky, that's all I saw. And then I had a friend who introduced me to astronomy. And when I learned some things about astronomy, I learned that there's a whole lot more to the night sky than just stars. In fact, I don't know if you can see in the picture, there's a smudge right there on the side. And now that I'm pointing out, you might be able to see it. That is actually a galaxy. That's a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. And what's amazing is now that I pointed it out to you, if you can see it, maybe on the back, you can see it better in that picture. Off on the right, there's a, a lighter smudge. That is the Andromeda galaxy. And because I pointed that out, now when you see that picture, you have a vocabulary for what you see. And what's amazing when I took astronomy is now that I look at the night sky, I just don't see stars. I see constellations like Orion's belt. And I know one star is called Betelgeuse. And another place I can look and see different nebula and galaxies. In fact, I, I bought a book of over a hundred objects that you can see in the night sky. And this is very technical, big descriptions of very beautiful objects. And the more that I study this book and the more that I look at these pictures, the more that I, then I go out into the night sky and I'm just overwhelmed because it's not just stars. It's a nebula, a galaxy, a cluster of stars. And the beauty and the majesty in my heart and my mind just is overwhelmed. 
Well, here's the great truth about God's word. As we come to read it, the Holy Spirit gives us a brand new vocabulary, a new way of seeing and understanding his world. And the more we know him, the bigger he gets. Uh, I read this story this week. It was someone posted online. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, A little boy uh, asked his dad, Dad, how big is God? And so the dad went out into uh, the went outside and pointed up and there was a plane going by. And the dad pointed up to the, the sky and said, he's about as big as that, he's, he's big like that plane. And the boy looked up and said, well, oh, that's not very big. And so then the dad drove the boy to an airport. And the boy went to the airport and saw the big, huge jumbo jet. And the boy said, yes, now I see, this is big. And the dad said this to the son, you know, the closer you get, the bigger it becomes. And the same thing is true in our relationship with God. The closer we get to him, the bigger he'll come and the more glorious he will be. And so listen, in our lives, in order to know God, we need a spiritual vocabulary. Uh, We need to understand and know things that we've never known or seen before. And the wonderful truth of my experience in God's words is the more I read this, the more that my mind is blown away. Uh, it doesn't matter how young or how old you are, you can keep going back to this book and the Holy Spirit reveals greater and greater truths to you. And your picture of God does not get smaller. Your view of him gets bigger. So this morning, if you want to know God, you need a teacher. And you'll hear that teacher when you open up the book that he's written, God's Word. So I'm so thankful that we can know God. God is known through God and through God alone. And the Holy Spirit plumbs the depths of God, knows the the mind and the heart of God, and in his grace, the Holy Spirit freely gives those words to us. God spoke those words to men of old, and they wrote down the Spirit's words for us so that we can know it. And as we read these words, the Holy Spirit works in our heart, heart and life and teaches us wonderful things that we've never heard before. So this morning, we see this book as a wonderful gift to us. Um, a couple years ago, <laughs> um, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was tired and exhausted and days in the house was pitch dark, pitch black. And I went to get a glass of water and I went to the corner and forgot that there was a wall on one side and I smacked my face right into the wall. Boy, did that hurt. Um, I should have turned on a light. Psalm 119, 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, there are many people in our world who are stumbling in the darkness. Uh, There are many people who do not know the right way to live or where to go. And there are many people who do not know God and his ways because they are avoiding the way that God has revealed himself to us. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So this morning, we have a choice. Each one of us has a choice on what we're going to do with what God has given to us. We can take his words in a casual manner. Uh, We can, like our social media feeds, just scroll through it mindlessly, not paying any attention to what's written. Or or we can take these words as life-giving and life-changing. This morning, we have a choice. Uh, We can live our lives going on our own, trying to find out how to live on our own power, our own steam. Or we can say, I'm going to go to the source where the Holy Spirit has delivered the revelation of God to us. This morning, you have a choice. Do you want intimacy with God? Do you want to know him? Do you want your mind to be overwhelmed by his majesty and his beauty? Well, it will when we get into his word.